everyone. It's Stephanie with The Patient Story, and I hope you're all doing well wherever you're joining us from. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening even. I am so thrilled to introduce our special guest today, um, a leading voice in uh, MPNs and, and the studies and the research going on, Dr. Ruben Mesa, who's a professor of medicine and executive director of the UT Health San Antonio MD Anderson Cancer Center. Dr. Mesa, welcome today. Stephanie, it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, I, I know we have a lot to cover because really the impetus, um, the conversation should happen throughout the year, but the impetus was this big blood cancer conference where people are sharing these ideas and updates from all this research. So I wanna get your thoughts and the big takeaways. And I know it has um, shifted a lot, <laughs> it's changed a lot, right? So the conversations you were having or doctors were having with patients, you know, with myelofibrosis back then versus now, vastly different, right? You, you know, I, as I break it down for folks, I look at it really in terms of that first 15 years and the second 15 years. And what happened in the middle was the discovery of the JAK2 mutation. So the, the first in a series of discoveries as to the genetic changes as to why patients develop MPNs. So prior to that, we were trying to do everything we could to help MPNs. We did not have any drugs that were specifically developed for the diseases. We had to really beg, borrow, or steal drugs that were being developed for other reasons, but nothing was particularly effective. And then in this second 15 years, that scientific discovery really fueled uh, an era of development of new therapies, uh, of several drugs that have now been approved, uh, of many drugs that are in development and important progress that, that uh, again, we really saw at this year's ASH. So uh, tremendous progress, but that was really the watershed moment that, uh, that discovery of the JAK2 mutation. Thank you for, for sharing that. And um, as a fellow blood cancer patient, I'm, you know, indebted to, to the brilliant minds who decide what are the areas that are hardest, where there are unmet needs, let's just go and tackle them. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and I know that our patients and caregivers do as well. So, so without further ado then, you know, you mentioned ASH, the name of this big conference. What were the sort of big high level takeaways for you on what was presented this year? Well, well first let me frame for patients that the ASH meeting is really the key meeting that occurs on an annual basis where we connect regarding the updates across all blood diseases. But for MPNs, it's probably the single most critical global meeting on an annual basis. So it really makes a big impact where uh, the key discoveries are, are announced as well as key clinical trial data. So it really is the key piece. And even though this year it was uh, hybrid, it's about 13,000 in person, but overall 30,000 participating, the key meeting. Now, key takeaways, as I've shared with MPN patients, I think it should be really a sense of hope. Uh, there is tremendous progress going on on all fronts. Progress in terms of trying to understand the biology of the disease. Why does it occur? Why do people progress? You know, and that's critical research that then really ends up developing, you know, how we monitor the disease, how we diagnose it, how we help to prevent progression. Myself as a treating hematologist, you know, the area I focus on are, you know, what are the therapies we can really use either now or in the near future? And I'd highlight that one, there's real progress in the earlier MPNs of ET and Pivera diseases where we've had a limited number of drugs for a very long time. So a couple of important studies to, to mention there in terms of new options that may be available soon. Second, in myelofibrosis, very important studies, multiple new therapies, both that are either JAK inhibitors, a certain class of drugs that we've been testing, but many non-JAK inhibitors. And now many questions of, should these be combined and in which setting? I love to highlight this word combined. You know, we, we know that drugs are tested to be used individually first, you know, and then people talk about, well, now let's study how they do with others and, 
and then maybe move them up. Um, you know, so, so there's a lot to talk about. And I know, like you said, promising, promising time. So you, do you want to start? I know there's a lot, there's three different areas here to cover. Um, do you want to start with the uh, ET, the essential thrombocythemia or? Yes. Why don't we start with it with ET? Okay. So with ET, our current landscape is our options primarily are hydroxyurea for cytoreductive therapy. Everyone's on an aspirin, but some people get hydroxyurea or have been getting pegylated interferon uh, off-label to control accounts, or anagrolide use as second line. So a relatively limited bench, three drugs. Some people receive ruxolitinib uh, if they have failed these prior therapies. So first, there is a drug that's now been approved in PVERA called ropegylated interferon alpha-2b or Vesremi. And so I presented data on an on a evolving study that's still accruing that is looking at the role of ropegylated interferon versus a control drug, anagrolide, for patients that have ET, have a high plate count, have a high white count, but have failed hydroxyurea. So that could be very important because that could lead, if that study is beneficial, to ropegylated interferon potentially being approved for patients with ET. Potential benefits of an interferon in ET, it may help to, in addition to controlling the platelet count, which is a key goal, it may help to impact the biology of the disease more, decrease the likelihood of disease progression, control symptoms, so there may be a, a stronger advantage. There was also a second trial presented a drug that is being tested both in my center, but also a trial across Europe that is trying to work on the bone marrow in a slightly different way. It's a drug called IMG7289 or Bamadenstat. And this was a trial for patients who had been on hydroxyurea, failed hydroxyurea, have a high plate account. So as you get a sense, kind of a recurring theme, what's an unmet need? People go on hydrea, they don't tolerate it, the counts aren't controlled, so what else do you do next? So this drug showed that the vast majority of people who had failed one or more drugs were able to have their platelets controlled by this new drug that is investigational, uh, and that was very favorable. Some side effects can impact uh, some nausea, the taste of sense of taste, that might be modified by the dose and when it is taken, but a, but a positive early study. So for people less initiated, we typically try a drug, we have a sense whether it's safe before it gets into clinical trials. We try to find a dose, then we try to see, is it effective for what we're uh, hope to use it for? And then the final step for approval is, is it better than what we currently use? So the ROPEG is really asking the question, is it better than what we currently use? Is it better than an agrolide, which is the current state for second line therapy for ET? The IMG7289 is a little earlier, but asking that question, does it lower the platelets? It seems like it, it does. So the next logical question will be, what well, is it better than these other things? Thank you for taking us through, because that's one of the questions. You have different phases you know, and it's talking about dose and then all the way through, is it better than the current standard of care? Um, and so you're giving us an idea of when patients may be able to see this. We don't have a crystal ball, but it sounds like the ROPEG is further along, right? It's in phase three. And we, after this part of it, hope that's when the FDA will say, oh, we approve it or we don't approve it. And maybe people will have access to it, right? Correct, correct. So it has a, a greater likelihood of being something that their doctor might be able to prescribe sooner if, if appropriate. You know, both are things potentially that individuals might be able to access through a clinical trial if they're in that situation and it is, you know, feasible for them to participate in a trial. 
Perfect. You know, and you talked about side effects, which is one of the top questions always. Another is administration or the way someone would take it. Could you compare? So you talked about Ropeg and then I'm not even going to attempt. It sounded like a license plate. I am G the way patients would get it and compare that to what the current standard is. So the the IMG 7289 or Vomodemstat is a pill. So they'd be taking it in that fashion. The ropegulated interferon is a small injection under the skin. People self-administer like a diabetic might give themselves insulin that they would give themselves every two weeks. So it's a little more complicated, but for people that have been on these therapies, usually it's, it's not that big a burden. You know, a very small injection, Women have done it with hormones if they're dealing with infertility, diabetics with insulin. So it seems a little intimidating at first, but usually people are able to get the swing of it pretty well. Right, because a lot of these drugs now are, are oral, right? They're pills. So this would be... Correct. Yeah, the majority are, are oral now, but, but there are, are some that are subcutaneous and fewer, uh, but some that are need to be administered you know, in a doctor's office through an IV or something of that nature. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mesa. Yeah, these are sometimes the, the quality of life impact, you know, um, that people people wonder about. One other thing about the ROPEG, is it is it a biologic? I mean, I, what I heard you say was that it will help with the disease and not just maybe control it or control some of these symptoms. So could there, what I'm asking is, would this actually help, right? Would this actually help with the disease as opposed to, well, we're just trying to make sure that the, the platelets are okay or, um, you know, other, other uh, major symptoms of, of ET. Both drugs actually are ones that we hope have an impact really under the underlying biology of the disease and the early cells in the bone marrow, the stem cells that, that are affected. So we, for the most part, most of the therapies we're looking at we hope really are not like our older drugs that were, you know, quote, chemotherapy drugs that just are lowering the number of cells. We hope that, yes, the cells are lowered because that's important, but it does so because it's making an impact on the disease. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Any last message for ET patients and caregivers before we shift? Just to be hopeful that there may be, you know, multiple new options available soon. But if at the current time, their therapy really is not achieving its goals, you know, that to speak with their healthcare provider to see if one of these trials might be an option for them. And for everyone who wants to see Dr. Mesa's full conversation, just head to thepatientstory.com where you'll find human answers to your cancer questions.